extraordinary things that radical Americans have done. Imagine a saying in the 1770s that the British Empire would have to leave. Can you crack that? That was the, the, the leap into the unknown subject he was just talking about. That's not common sense. It's counterintuitive. Up to that point, that monarch was divine. That monarch's family came from God, and they talked to God. And they turned around, and they told a series of priestly bureaucrats down, down all the way to your altar what God was saying. And you couldn't say no to that. But we got trashed up in the Old South Meeting Hall in Boston, and we went down to that ship and threw the tea in the drink. Amazing! I want to ask you, we've got to find the equivalent of that right now. Rosa Parks sitting in the wrong part of the bus. The things that radical Americans have done, we're at that point now. And the fact is, the fact is that we can't figure out what that act of courage and bravery is that Sasha talked about. We can't, we can't figure it out. We don't know what it is. There has not been a consensus among progressive people for change to peace for many years. Many years. We don't know what to do. We don't have a common strategy. We don't have an intellectual strategy. We're not, we're not guided like some of our fathers and mothers were by Marxism. We don't have a single way of looking at the world. We don't have a, 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 a lever. We don't have a mechanical, deterministic way of looking at history. Don't have that. Now, Amazing if we did, wouldn't it? <laughs> we got many, 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 many histories. Jabber, jabber, jabber. We got, we got, we got clouds of people talking to us right now. There isn't one voice. There isn't one leader. We don't have a Martin Luther King. We're lost right now. We're lost such that it looks like Barack Obama's use of the word change was to stop change. We're lost right now. I think the first step is to admit how lost we are, how far away peace is, how habitual and a part of our economic life. You've heard the phrase perma-war. That's what's happening now. We have a peace candidate who goes into office and changes his mind. And his changing of his mind was, was the change he was talking about. What? I remember having a feeling, I remember having a feeling when I went to see that man. I had a feeling. Did you have a feeling? It was an inchoate feeling. It was, it was a non-specific feeling. But it was a warm, good feeling about the, the human logic of decency. The inevitability of decency, of peace, of helping one another. He was quoting Mahatma Gandhi. He was quoting Cesar Chavez. And we were getting back in touch with our best angels, as Abraham Lincoln said. And we were so grateful to him for that. And we haven't really been willing to discuss so openly. I'm feeling a little bit nervous right now. Discuss so openly the level of disappointment we feel. But I, I'm, 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 I'm here to suggest that it actually is time to be a radical American. Yes. That is what Jesus was. <laughs> well, some of the Jimmy Swagger like people I'm imitating would say he was American. <laughs> They probably said, yeah, he's driving a pickup truck with a gun rack. <laughs> I'd like to 
remember something together with you people in this place. Most of us saw Barack Obama. And the experience we had with him was like a kind of experience that we may have had at a Joan Bias concert. It's the kind of experience we may have had when we were younger and we saw the clash. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a kind of feeling that we got when we really sat down and we let Howard Zinn teach us. There's something about the quality of Barack Obama's election, and it may be what it may be the gift he had for us is his election, and that's not a small gift. Well, well, it might not be his presidency, it was his election process. We were at that moment inside those 45 magical words, the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution. We were in public space. <coughs> it's not the thing that we were hearing. It's what we were doing with our bodies, being together, listening to this young man that had grown up around the world, was standing here before us, this young African-American man who we, we started imagining in this wonderful leap of belief could become our president. We were standing in a commons together, and by being there together in our bodies, we were creating that commons. We were establishing public space. We were enforcing those 45 words that, that, that Tommy, Jeff, and Jimmy Mad wrote in the 1780s. Those five freedoms, religion, speech, press, peaceable gathering, and protest. We were making that First Amendment live again. The fact is that it needed to be reclaimed. Many of the places where tens of thousands of Americans went to listen to Barack Obama, many of those public spaces, those plazas, those parks, had been shut down to public speech. Many of them were surrounded by enclosures of permits. Many of them had local prejudices enforcing an inhibition on free speech. And people didn't notice that. In St. Louis, there were 100,000 people that day under the, under, the, under, the big, under the big arch. No, you couldn't do that unless everybody demanded to do that. And at that moment, we were radicals. Radicals in a way that we can't be now that he's president. We miss that. We, we know the change viscerally. Amen? We, we feel the change vis viscerally. And we're wondering where that, where that might happen again. I'm sorry, but many of us are not believing it's possible. Electronic. Cards. 